Daniel chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. If you're there, say amen. If you ain't, say ouch. All right. And the king spake unto that fellow right there, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability. Everybody say ability. Ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. They wanted to change their language. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, not of God's meat, but of the king's meat, and of the wine, which speaks of spirit, which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. All right, now I want you to go to Genesis. You don't have to go there, but I want to read you something in Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, I believe it was. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so God created man, you and me, in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female. I'm going to get in trouble this morning. Created he them. I want to preach a little while this morning from the subject of image changers. Image changers. Because did you know so many of the people that I minister to today, the greatest problem they have, Allie Gray, is their image of who they are. Their image of how they see themselves. They see themselves by their mistakes, John. They see themselves by their failures. And so many times, tragically, Pastor Bobby, they see themselves through the definition of somebody else. You and I as believers were created to gain our image from God the way we see ourselves and the way we see others. But if we do not let God define us, ultimately we let the world define us or we let our failures define us or we let our weaknesses define us. I wonder, Chelsea, how many people I'm preaching to today that if they would be honest, they would say, Pastor, I struggle with my image. I want to submit to you that if you struggle with the way you see yourself, you're seeing yourself through the wrong lens. You're not seeing yourself accurately. You're seeing yourself through a lie. If the enemy can lie to you about who you are, then he can lie to you about everything else because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is it. We've raised up a generation that no church but they don't know who they are in Christ. And if you don't know who you are, you don't know what you can do. And you can't know who you are and what you can do if you don't know where you came from. Because identity is not gained on what I'm able to do. Identity is gained on where I came from. And when I establish my identity, that changes what I'm able to do. But if I listen to the enemy who tells me I'm a do nothing, if I listen to the lying voice of Satan that tells me I'm a failure, then I'm destined to fail. That's why the enemy fears that when the children of God get in the presence of God among the people of God, because in that environment you are able to hear God define who you are. One of the powerful things about worship is you can't spend 30, 45 minutes telling God who he is without him rolling back the heavens and beginning to tell you who you are. That's what makes hell fear worship because worship is when I gain the ability not just to declare who God is, but God, by the moving of his spirit, he wants to declare who you are. I'm gonna go ahead and, ahead and say it. God did not put anybody on this earth to be a failure. God did not put anybody on this earth to be a broke down, drug addicted somebody. That is a lie of the enemy. Let God define you this morning. 
on. I'm going to push on some stuff that I ain't pushed on in about 12 years. And I'm going to need y'all to back me because the church has got to start saying some stuff about these images that the world has given us. I can't get no help in here. But I saw where a family let a five-year-old boy get a sex change. The devil is a liar. If he was born a boy, he's a boy. It ain't no complicated thing. The church, would the real church, please stand up. Please stand up. Y'all about to make me lose my mind up in here, up in here. A little shout out to DMX. It ain't no complicated thing. But when you quit letting God talk and you start letting fools talk because the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And if you can't get that right, then you get confused. Is it boy? Is it girl? How complicated is it? I saw where people are going off now because of the gender reveal parties. Because they're saying gender reveal parties ain't right because the kid ought to have the ability to choose. You don't choose that. God chooses that. He created you in your mother's womb. It ain't no complicated. A boy is a boy and a girl's a girl and anything that says anything different is a lie from hell. I can't get no help. We need some of this preaching. We backed up so much trying to be nice. We've raised up a bunch of people that have no structure. And then the preacher say something that's common sense and oh, he's being offensive. We need to be offended. When we're letting them change the sex of a five-year-old boy, when we're letting them take care of the kids, and do you know that's making them a eunuch? That that boy that could have been a father will never have kids now because as a five-year-old, they let him make a choice about the rest of his future, but they won't let him vote for president. They won't let him drive a car. They won't let him own a gun, but they will let him decide the rest of his life as a fight. Do you not see the spirits that we are dealing with in this hour? That's why God is putting a fresh anointing on the church. That when the world is confused out there, they can come in here and finally hear some common sense and finally get some boundaries. Five years of age, I wanted to be a rocket scientist. I don't know what I wanted to be. But I thank God mom and dad just didn't turn me loose because parents are set in your life to give boundaries, to give guidelines, and I've never seen a time where people are more confused. We're afraid to talk to each other. I mean, do I say, hey, hey ma'am, or are they gonna get offended and say, I'm a sir, or I identify as a rainbow? You don't know! Because in today's world, people, this spirit of the age, it's made us afraid to even have normal conversations. It's made us afraid. We don't know how to see ourselves. We don't know how to see other people. We don't know how they identify. I want you to understand that God created the church. Not that there would be black and white. The Bible said there would neither be bond nor free, Jew nor Greek, but they would be one in Christ. That when you roll up in here, God doesn't see Democrat. He doesn't see Republican. He just sees his sons and his daughters. My identity is found in who I am in him. Now I'm about to say some stuff in here and I'm, I'm saying it because I want to help people because I've never seen a time where people are getting tripped up with what we 20 years ago would have considered trivial stuff. God left the church here to paint an image. An image is a powerful thing. An image is not who I am. An image is how they perceive me to be. An image ain't the thing. An image is a reflection of the thing. In fact, an image is so powerful, it can evoke emotions out of you. Give me that first image, Ricky. Image of a swoosh. What's that a symbol of? It ain't a trick question. What? Nike. Y'all knew without a word, just by the symbol, by the image. Some of y'all, that gives you images of Michael Jordan flying through the air. Duncan from the free throw line. Some of you, it gives you images of those, those cool shoes you had back in high school. Nike, it evokes images. All because that image represents Nike. That image ain't Nike, but it represents Nike. Next image. What's that an image of? The devil, right. That's right, Starbucks. Well, you have to roll into Starbucks and say, yes, I would like a flippy, frappy, frappuccino with extra drizzy alley, and I want a grande. And you order a grande, and it's that big. 
Grande means grand. It means huge. And, grand, and you speak in, but I don't speak Starbucks. When I see that image, it evokes feelings of fear and panic because I see lines and I see a bunch of people that just like to sit around and sip coffee. But when Carlene sees that image, her mouth starts watering because that image means different things to her than it does me. But without a word, you guys knew that that image represented Starbucks, whatever Starbucks means to you. Next image. What's that? Awesome company. Represents masculinity. Represents supporting their troops. Represents people that still believe me. I love Under Armour. But without the words, y'all knew what that one meant. Next one, Ricky. I, 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 French fries, Big Macs, McDonald's, Golden Arches. This image is universally known. This image means if I'm hungry, I can go get a meal that's going to take two years off my life. Everybody knows what this is. This image ain't McDonald's, but this image makes everybody think of McDonald's. Now, the church has been left here to paint an image of God and create an image of what it means to live as a child of God and the victory and the peace that we should have as people of God. And the church has been left here to paint a picture of what real love is. Real love. Now, we let NBC and ABC define what love is by that show called The Bachelor. You let 30 women roll in on me and, and you trying to date each other and everyone to figure out. That don't work in no, on nothing but television. And everybody's glued in to watch it, even my wife. Everybody wants to, but we've let the world show us what their version of love is. So when you start getting wrinkles, love goes away. When you go through a failure, love goes away. I believe last night my cousin sent me a picture of what real love is. Ricky, would you put that picture up of my grandparents right here? I want to show you what real love is. An 89-year-old man and an 87-year-old woman that have been married for over 70 years, battled cancer four different times, and they say, come thick or thin, hell or high water, we in it to win. That, my friends, is what real love looks like. That's love. That's love. But now we, we've got pictures of love that I just don't. I just don't feel it anymore. There are times in our marriage, Carlene probably just ain't felt like doing nothing but choking me out. But there was a love. And now, because the world has defined what love is, we think God loves like we love. Which means as soon as it gets tough, God bails out, according to the world. But God left the church on planet earth to establish what real love is. Real love is not eros. Real love is not phileo. Eros means erotic, sexual. Uh, phileo means friendship. Real love is agape, which means unconditional. The Bible said God is love. God is agape. God is an unconditional love, which means I love you even when you ain't worth loving. And I stick with you even on the bad day. And when others walk away, I still am with you. And God left the church here to convince people that he is the ultimate image of love. Next image, Ricky, I want you to see it, of the cross. This image right here, to some people it's two sticks and a piece of scarlet. But to those of us that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, it is our symbol of freedom, our symbol of hope, our symbol of peace. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. The tragedy is more people in this generation identify with McDonald's than they do this old rugged cross. They did a survey and more young people knew what McDonald's meant than they knew what the cross meant. That's why we ought to celebrate that Friday we have a group of young people that are saying, I don't just know about McDonald's. I know about Jesus and I know him as my savior and I'm not ashamed to go down to the river and be baptized. God left the church here to paint an image. God said, when I make man, I made them in my image and in my likeness, that's why hell hates you because you're made in his image. Satan came into the garden and he took away the likeness, but he never could destroy the image. That even when my kids ain't acting like me, they still for the most part look like me or Carlene. Sometimes they don't act like I want them to act, but they still bear my image. 
they still bear their mother's image. So the enemy came down. And he took away man's likeness from God, but he still hated man because every time he saw man, man's image reminded him of God. Your image reminds you of God. So Satan said, if I can't take away the image, I need to lie to him about the image. I need to tell him there is no God, that there's nothing different between them and a monkey, uh, that they're just an amoeba that grew a backbone, climbed out of a pond, swung from a tree, and became a human being. The devil is a liar. When you begin to realize that I came from God and I one day shall return to God, that there is something special about me in the eyes of God, that changes everything about your life. But the world tells us that it's evolution. The world tells us that nothing created everything. And now you've got kids that are acting like animals. Why? Because their teachers tell them they are nothing but an animal. So you can't tell them they're animals and then get mad at them when they act like it. But we, we came up in a generation that we knew deep down in our core there was a creator. There was a God. There was something different about us. Yeah, you need to be dog, nice to your dogs and your cats and your puppies and all that, but they ain't the same in God's eyes as you are. I've got to tell you, you are special in the eyes of God because you were created in his image and in his likeness. The king Nebuchadnezzar said, I see the people of God and they have an image of God. The shout of the king is among them and I don't want them to worship God. I want them to worship me. So what did king of Babylon, which means confusion, do? He said, I want you to go get all the good looking, all the skillful, all the cunning, all the intelligent, all those that have the seed. And I want you to bring them into Babylon. Don't get them all. Just get the ones that are different. Get the ones that stand out. Because the enemy knows if he can get the leaders, everybody else will follow. The enemy knows if he can get those that are gifted, everybody else is going to follow. So he comes, he gets those that are gifted. He gets those that are unique, those that stand out, those that have the seed of the king in them. You've got to stick with me right now because a lot of the battle you have went through is because of the seed that God Almighty put in you. And he said, I want to get them and I want to bring them into my kingdom and I want to change their diet. I want to change their name. And I want to change what they drink. Help me preach this Holy Ghost. The enemy wanted, the first thing he wanted to do was change their name. Why? He wanted them to forget who they are. The enemy wants you to forget, Gray, that you're special. The enemy wants you to forget, Ethan, that you're special in the eyes of God. The world does everything it can, Brad, to make you forget that you are a child of the Most High God, that there is something different and something special about you. Now, after he changed their name, the Bible said that he changed their diet. He tried to change, which means doctrine. So many times what we've allowed to happen is we've let the world define our children. We've let the school system be more vocal than the house of God about the identity of our kids. While the church has remained silent, we have seen a generation of young people stolen from the church because their first year in college, like Patty Varney told me, they were convinced that they were, there was no God because the world was louder and more vocal than the church. And we, if we eat the wrong thing, we're gonna get the wrong results. Third thing was they changed their spirit. They changed what they were drinking. Wine in the Bible always is symbolic of spirit. He wants the spirit of this age to get on you. Spirit of fear, spirit of doubt, a spirit of worry, a spirit of, of, of hatred. Have you ever seen a time where people are more bitter and more cynical and you can't laugh and you can't have fun anymore because there's a spirit being poured out in the age and it's poisoning the minds of our young people. It's making them believe that they're one way when God says they're another. It's making them believe that their best days are never going to come. It's making them believe that everything is fatalistic and miserable. And we've got a generation of young people that are they're, they're drinking from the wrong spirit. They're drinking from the wrong fountain. That's why God left the church here. That when they realize all the spirits they're drinking of out there are making them sick, they could come to the house of God and say, I'm thirsty for something that's gonna fill my soul. I'm thirsty for something that's gonna make me feel better about life. That's why the Bible said, let everyone that is thirsty come and drink of the waters of life freely. I just want somebody to know the stuff the world's giving you, it'll make your soul stick. But the stuff God 
God Almighty's given you, it'll make you feel better. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. That when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the Spirit of God came in like a mighty rushing wind, and on them were cloven tongues as of fire, and he poured out his Spirit, and they said they're a bunch of drunk men. I'll come to tell some there's a fresh wave of the Holy Ghost, and we're going to get drunk on the Spirit of God. So drunk we're not afraid. So drunk we're not nervous. So drunk we're not suicidal. And the world's going to look in here and say, I want what they're having. I want what the church is serving up. I'm sick of the church serving the same junk the world's serving. Political correctness. Fear of telling the truth for it might offend somebody. Now we've got a generation that comes to the house of God to hear the truth, but we're afraid to say it. They thirsty for somebody to give them a, a, a drink of what our image really is in the eyes of God, of what we were really created to be. But that kind of preaching makes people nervous, preacher. That kind of preaching also sets people free. That kind of preaching also makes demons run out of people's lives. That kind of preaching also delivers people from suicide and addiction when you let God give them the image of who they are. Because the sickest I've ever been in my life is when I saw myself through the wrong lens. Because you can come to this church and believe God's awesome. But if you believe you're a nothing and you're a nobody and you don't matter, and you're just a result of your mistake, you're still going to be limited. But if you get in the eyes of your father and say, God, cause me to see myself through your eyes. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at Grayson, and, and I've said, Grayson, if you could just see yourself the way I see you. A lot of these things you deal with, you would never deal with anymore. I believe that's what's so important about worship because we could get in the presence of God and he could begin to cause us to see ourselves the way he sees us. He sees you with eyes of love. The Bible says he rejoices over you with singing. That's what your Bible says. The Bible says that your heavenly father rejoices over you with singing. When my kids come around, I don't say most of the time. I don't say, well, here they come again. Now, there's a few times I do say that. But most of the time, I'm like, here they are. What's up, Grayson? What's up, Jakey? I'm so glad you're here. I rejoice over them because that's my kids. They got my image. They got their mama's image. When you come into the presence of God, God gets happy because he said, there's my kids. And they came to let me bless them. And they came to let me minister to them. That's why the world spends so much time trying to convince you that your image is flawed that your image is messed up. The Bible said when Jesus came that he was so wounded that his visage was marred. That means the image. They took the image of Jesus and marred his image, put a crown of thorns upon his head, beat him unrecognizable. See, Jesus had to lose his image so that he could give you your image, so that you could begin to see yourself, not for who you used to be, but for who God called you to be. What I'm trying to tell somebody is when you understand this book, you begin to understand. You might have done what they said you did, but you're not who they say you are. You're a child of the most our God that has power and authority in the earth. The enemy don't want you to hear this. The enemy wants you going into God's presence and saying, oh God, I'm a worm. I'm a low down, dirty, rotten dog. I made a mistake last week. I made a mistake last month. I made a mistake this morning. God don't want to hear that. It doesn't bless me if my kids come into my presence bad, mouth, bad mouthing themselves. What blesses me is when my children, when I see them finding out who they are in God, when I see them gaining confidence and understanding that God put them on the planet to make a difference. I thank God that Chelsea found out that she was a worship leader that could sing and bring the anointing. I thank God that in Sean's dark place, he found out that he was more than just a mean little guy, that he could preach, that he could sing, and he could bring down the power of God. I pray today that somebody that came in here here with a marred image somebody that came in here with a broken self reflection would get in the presence of God and find out who you are but the enemy has been showing you the wrong mirror 
The enemy has been painting the wrong picture because our challenge is we live in two worlds at one time. Can I preach a little while this morning? Do you remember when they came to Jesus and they said, Caesar says that we should pay taxes unto him, but you say we should give unto God. What should we do? And Jesus said, take out your coin. They took out their coin, and Jesus said, whose image is inscribed upon it? And they said, Caesar's. He said, render unto Caesar's that which is Caesar's, but render unto God that which is God. See, my body lives in this earth, but my spirit is connected unto God. This earth tries to tell me what my image is as a result of my shortcomings, my fears, my failures, my struggles, what ain't going right. But my image doesn't come from that world. My image is from another world. It's like when Jesus said, I, my kingdom is not of this world. The reason this world couldn't break Jesus is because he refused to let this world define him. He said, I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. But so many of you have let this world define you. Pastor, you don't know what I did. Pastor, you don't know what I struggle with. Pastor, you don't know what those I love said about me. You don't know what those I love think about me. And because of that, you have let the enemy give you the wrong end. Put up 2 Corinthians 3. Um, 16 through 18, no, just verse 18, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. I want y'all to see this right now because if you let the enemy give you the mirror of failure, you're gonna reflect what you see. The you you see is the you you gonna be, if that makes any sense unto thee. The you you see is the you you gonna be. So if you let the enemy tell you you're nobody, you're gonna act like a nobody. When God says, that ain't who you are. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. And if you can't get there, it's okay, I, I can find it. For we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into that same image, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Here's what God said. God said, when you begin to worship, and you begin to see God for who he is in all his glory, and you begin to reflect on God, you are changed into that same image, even as by the glory of God. You see, the more I see him, the more I'm gonna be like him, the more I worship him, the more I'm gonna reflect him, and they're going to look at me and see the image of the Father that sent me. It is the will of God for them to look at you and see the image of your Father. The tragedy with the modern day church is we have reflected the image of flesh and not the image of our Father. John Wesley was a great preacher and he would preach and crowds much larger than this would come and he had no microphone, he had no Facebook, he had no Twitter, he had no Snapchat, he had no Instagram, none of that stuff, but he had the anointing. And it, that anointing reached throughout all of America and other parts of the world and people become mesmerized. Why do people come to hear him scream? Why do people come to hear him preach, Tammy? And finally, an interviewer from Washington came all the way down to one of those meetings and he was captivated because people were crammed in and gathered on hillsides to hear John Wesley preach the gospel. And when the meeting was over, the interviewer asked him, he said, why is it that all these people come to hear you, Mr. Wesley? And Mr. Wesley said, the answer is easy. I get in the presence of God. I catch myself on fire with his spirit and they just come to watch me burn. I'm trying to tell somebody that when you get into the presence of God, they will look at you and see the image of your father and they will want the God that you serve. But if I'm so drunk on the spirit of this world, if I'm so intoxicated by the lies of this world, that though I be a child of God, they'll look at me and they won't see no faith. They won't see no hope. They won't see no peace. I say, but I'm saved, man. But I reflect fear. I reflect doubt. I reflect my own shame and my own insecurities. And I say, what's wrong? It's all because I've let the world tell me what my image is. I've let the enemy tell me what my image is. But we live in a time as Chelsea begins to play that people have had their image fractured. It could have been by your mistakes. It could have been by somebody that loved you that dropped you at a critical time. But because of that, the enemy has begun to define you. But here's what you do. Me and Jake, Jacob bought a tool. And Jake 
he has a hard time with the instruction manual in so much that he refuses to read it. And it had a break on it, John, so because it had a break, it went on funny. The blade did. And so Jake was just going to try to just wheel it on there, and that wasn't working. And I said, Jake, I have a radical idea. He said, what's that, Dad? I said, let's read the instructions. I read the instructions, and we put that thing together. God did not leave you on the planet without giving you the instructions on how to get fixed if you are broken and fixed if you are hurting. If you have a John Deere tractor and it breaks down, you look at that John Deere tractor and because of the image, because of the inscription, you know you don't take it to Cub Cadet to get fixed. You gotta take it to a John Deere dealer. I'm going somewhere with this. If you have a Ford and it breaks down, some say it stands for fix or repair daily. I say it stands for first on race day. But say by some act of weirdness, your Ford breaks down. Because of the image and because of the inscription, you know where to take that Ford because you know who knows how to fix it. But yet when we break down, where do I go when I'm broken? If I go and I put myself in the hands of people, that don't even believe in my God. How can they fix me if they don't know where my parts came from? How can they put me back together if they don't even know where I came from and what I'm made of? And so many times when we get broken, we don't go back to the manufacturer. We let the world try to fix us. I'm trying to tell somebody this joy that we have, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. That when I am broken, give me to my father. He knows how to put me back together. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I he knows how to fix me he knows how to help me he knows how to bless me he knows how to put me back everybody stand to your feet where do you go when you're broken The wrong voices have defined you. I have heard your cry in the night season. You have looked for help, but yet you have not sought me. You have sought the voice of other people. And voices that used to speak to you have now even turned away. Things that used to comfort you have failed you. Yes, they have even hurt you. Things that were a pleasure in one season have become a pain in this season. And yea, you come to my house empty and you feel toxic. You feel poisoned by the way you see you. But behold, I have brought you here today to tell you you've been living the lie of a wrong definition. For they do not have the power to define you, yea, even your mistakes They do not have the power to define you. That your definition only comes from me. And the battle you have fought is because you do indeed bear my image. And I brought you here to anoint you that not only do you bear my image, but you begin to reflect my likeness. You have even said, is there a God? You have cried out, is is this all there is to life? 
But I brought you here this day and what you feel is otherworldly. What you feel is another spirit. It is the spirit of grace and the spirit of peace moving upon you even now. Behold, I want to draw you out of that dark place. I want to draw you out of that lie that they pinned on you in times past. And I want to bring you into the place where you begin to live from my word and live from my definition of who you are for I call you beloved. I call you child. I call you mine. Every hand lifted to the Lord right now. Most of the counseling sessions I do, if we, if we could boil it down, it would be boiled down to they're living a lie of the wrong image. The spirit of grace is in this place to heal your image. Can I tell you God wants you to feel good about being you because God didn't create junk? I want everybody that God's speaking to right now, I want you to step out of your seat and I want you to come to this altar as the spirit of grace is flowing in this place. And I want you to give my hand as they come because we've all been there. God wants to heal some images. God wants to heal some mindsets. Come on, come on, come on. Let the Spirit of God have His way in this place. There's some young people that need to come. There's some people that have been crying silent tears that need to come. You need to come. Come on. Put them hands together one more time. There's a few more people. God bless you, sweetie. God bless you. If the Spirit of grace is moving on you, I'm going to ask you to come right now. I'm going to ask my prayer warriors to come. And I'm believing for fresh oil to flow in this service today to wash away every lie that the enemy's told them. Hey, I'm Pastor Barry Absher. I want to thank you guys for liking and subscribing to our channel. All the feedback that we've received has been such a blessing. If you've not subscribed to our channel, I wanted to take this time to personally ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're really excited about what God is doing here at City on a Hill. And we're also excited about what God is doing in your life and in our lives together. Let's be part of the internet family. Let's link up. Let's join. Continue to watch our videos. Like, subscribe. Let's get on the train together and see what happens. God bless you so much. Bye-bye.